Welcome to GH, the GH Coffee Solutions Warehouse. Um, we're so happy to have you guys here. Yeah, what a fun thing. Hopefully we have a warehouse series now or something and <laughs> we can do this again sometime. Uh, but yeah, today's occasion is meet the founder of Bentwood, which is Manuel. Uh, we're super Thank happy to have, you. very happy to have you here from over from Switzerland. And uh, yeah, we just thought it would be a great time Especially since, you know, the Coffee Champs competitions are coming up. Uh, the Baltimore one is coming up in January. Um, then the Denver one will follow. And then, of course, uh, the, the national competition will happen in April. We have had the Bentwood on stage already at the Coffee Champs prelims. And, you know, we just thought it'd be a great time for roasters and competitors um, to ask some questions and also hear about the origin story of Bentwood. So, without further ado... Manuel. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's really cool being here. I was here a year ago as well um, for a visit to meet Gary and the team. And it, will, it feels like so much has happened in the meantime. You know? um, first of all, we launched the Grinder a bit more than two years ago. And back then, everyone was like, okay, what's that all about? New grinder, like most new grinders are focused on the home users. Like in a commercial segment, there hasn't been that much innovation for a while because it's as well very challenging in terms of um, the way it's used in coffee shops, which today are very demanding for all kinds of coffees, all kinds of recipes. Um, and in home usage as well, people get more demanding. Um, and then you want to make sure as well your product is certifiable and you can use it as well in all kinds of environments in a safe way. When I started this journey, uh, the question was really what could you do different with a grinder? And my, my thinking was it, there must be a way to create a grinder that is made really for the customer. Not from a, coming from an engineering background saying what is easy to produce or what is going to be cost efficient or how do all existing grinders look like, but come from a different angle and say, how do baristas work with that product? And what do they ultimately want to achieve? What they want to achieve is to have the best experience for their customers and have a good cup of coffee, right? Well, that is said very simply, but in reality today, when you talk about coffee, you talk about a wide range of preparing coffee. So the process of preparing the coffee, but as well, a wide range of coffees as in different beans and how they react to the coffee grinder. And there was about finding um, a team that would be able to create a grinder that meets all these needs in one product. So have something that works for espresso, but as well for filter drip coffee, work for cold brew as much as for Aeropress, work as an on-demand grinder with a time setting as much as a single dosing grinder, work for a light roast as much as for a dark roast. So not setting really limits to the customer in the end and how he's going to use the product and still always make sure that you get the best out of every bean in terms of taste. So when we had the first prototypes, it was all about just testing, testing over and over again and with blind cuppings, understanding which changes in terms of the mechanics would lead to the best taste. And what worked initially well maybe for a filter coffee wouldn't work well for espresso and would work for a dark coffee, wouldn't, dark roast wouldn't work for light roast. And so we had to do feedback loops all over again until we got to where we are today, um, where we see people that are not experienced in cupping coffees and still say my commercial grade coffee just tastes sweeter with that grinder to someone who's doing coffee competitions and says, you know, I have this very specific coffee with a high score and I really get out the best I could get out of it. So you got, want to make sure that the grinder breaks the beans in the best possible way. And then you might have personal preferences um, if you like a bit more of this or that, but that's then the fine tuning and here as well, the solution was to have a micrometric grind adjustment that you really have the control yourself um, to get the flavor notes out that you want. So knowing what you're actually doing by moving and being able to repeat that over and over again. Now, 
We had the first great results uh, when there were people using the grinders. It was still a prototype uh, for competitions and already winning back then. And, and people said, okay, it work, works apparently for, for Brewer's Cup for filter coffee, but can it really work as well for espresso? And then, for example, this year we had a guy winning the Dutch Barista Championships, um, so preparing the espressos with it. Um, and then people were, okay, that works as well. And then we had people using it for Aeropress Championships in Asia, and it worked as well. And, and I think that now gives the proof of the concept. Mm -hmm. And yeah, can you talk about some of the internals and some of the design aspects that, uh, some things that you did intentionally to make the coffee taste, you know, sweet and and have a great, you know, particle size distribution? Right. Well, the, the key was to look at the mechanics and not start from the existing ones. So typically what you have, the inside of a grinder, you have a motor and a capacitor, uh, you have the burr set, and that creates a module together, right? And then somehow you have a housing around. Well, here we look at it a bit like an onion. So you have uh, layers of aluminum um, and it's heavy parts. It's not little pieces. So it's heavy parts of aluminum that keep it cool because of that amount of mass. And, and these layers sit so perfectly one above it, the other one, uh, that everything sits there and the way it leaves the factory is supposed to stay forever that way. And, and that's why it's layered like an onion. And as well, there's only one way th the parts fit into each other. So that means as well, if someone, you know, opens up the grinder and reassembles, there's only one way to reassemble it. You always want to have things as aligned as possible inside of that grinder. Exactly. You know, so for example, the burrs, they sit in a tunnel uh, where, they, where they're forced to sit in parallel because that tunnel is so tight. If they would move out, they would already scratch the, the grinding chamber, make a terrible sound. Everyone would figure out there's an issue. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I love the sort of story about, or just your qualifications when it comes to, you know, working with the University of Zurich and understanding how to, you know, analyze the dry grounds that come out of a grinder. Um, and so you've worked with them a bit to analyze bentwood particles, right? Yeah, I mean, it was more by coincidence, to be honest. They did a series of tests, and for some tests, it was just so much easier for them to have something uh, where you can see the microns. Um, because it would be, instead of going back and every time measure in a laser particle analysis, they would just say, okay, I go here, 200 microns, next I do a try at 210 microns, then at 220. So it adds a lot of control in the process, which is great for, as well for scientific testing. Hmm, very cool. Um, yeah, and so let's just talk about the operations of the grinder and sort of like where it fits in a cafe and also, you know, how you would use it on the competition stage as well. But just, right. just how it operates and best practices when you're using it. Well, so first in a coffee shop, you basically have different ways of using it. So you could fill up the hopper and just work it as a standard espresso grinder doing the time settings. And there you go. You could single those and then just go with the on off and there as well quickly change coffee. So one of the beautiful things you got here is you can quickly just switch between filter and espresso. So you don't need to do anything in between. You just switch with the grind adjustment wheel. You know where you gotta go, it's repeatable, and it gives you a lot of flexibility. So in a coffee shop, you can do either way. And actually, I think we probably got 50% of customers that use it with a full hopper as an on-demand grinder, and 50% probably will use it as a single dose grinder. And then you have some customers that will use it um, with a batch brewer next to it and we'll do batch brewing and mostly use it for that. Mm -hmm. And that's, that might be as well a, a cultural thing. In some countries, batch brewing is a big thing, so you'll find that a lot in other countries. They focus clearly on espresso and they know like a couple of times a day, we have to do a filter and it's great we have that grinder because then we just get rid of the espresso beans and put in filter and there we go, we do a couple of shots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now for competitions, um, there as well, you, you have the full flexibility of working with it. And the great thing as well is you have the chance here as well to write down your settings and how your flavor notes 
and descriptors change as you adjust slightly. And it's really worth doing steps of 10 microns because as of 10 microns, you really start tasting a difference. So in that range, some, some people even go for five microns, but I think with 10 steps of 10, you're pretty good. And we normally tell people as well, like indicative uh, range that works for like a medium roast, a lighter roast, and how to play around as well. Same for drip coffees. Mm -hmm. And we always tell people to start around 600 microns and then start moving for their left and right. Mm. And so, you know, of course, different coffees, uh, you know, interact with different grinders in different ways and different brew methods and things. There's kind of an infinite amount of possibilities. But I would say there's kind of like a prevailing like flavor profile or like character of the coffee that the Bentwood often makes. Right. Like, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. And they actually, uh, that's a good link to like the scientific research that has been done. So compared to similar grinders, what you will find is a higher concentration of grounds exactly at the setting you put here. And you will always have less of the extreme fines and extreme boulders. The good thing is that does something good to all kinds of coffees because you never want to have the extreme bitterness or the extreme sour or fruity notes. Um, so as you cut these off, um, you will always have a positive impact, more clarity typically. Um, and as well, you'll get a lot of these pleasant fruity notes, um, sweetness, and, and then you can still fine tune, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I sort of love using it for espresso because I feel like it's just a very forgiving grinder in a way. Um, I just feel like, you know, I, I always give this anecdote where I think I was making a Little Waves coffee in our lab um, and making an espresso. And it was, you know, of course, someone brings in a bag for the first time. You haven't dialed it in. You're not sure what's going to happen. Um, but I had a good idea based on micron size, like where I might start and after one adjustment, it was in a great place. Um, as we know, like, you know, sometimes you're sort of like fishing around right. a long time before you hit, hit the right spot, so. Yeah, and, and that's actually something we're trying to encourage people really to set yourself the target to have within the first three shots, your perfect shot, right? Because um, let's say you start around 200 with a medium roast, and then the first shot is five seconds more or less, right? Then I would right away jump like around 50 microns and then I've probably the other extreme and then based on that I'll look for the middle of the two and then I should be there. Mm -hmm. And in that way you don't lose that much coffee but as well you don't spend that much time looking for the right grind setting. Mm -hmm. And once you've found it you just write it down and then that's it. And we have people a lot and that has helped now to build like a community over over time that online they share their recipes for, for their coffees. So they say, oh, I have that coffee from that roaster, I put that setting and people will have very similar results. Then of course you always have different room temperature, humidity, espresso machines. But you know, you get very close to the recipes other people have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sort of fascinated, I mean, I, I get the insight into, you know, what the Bentwood is doing in the US market, of course, but can you tell us a bit, you know, about where it's distributed in the world and, and who has been embracing it and what sort of partnerships you've, you know, come across in other parts of the world too? So we now ship to about 40 countries and really covering all continents from Australia, Asia, um, Middle East, Latin America, North America, Europe. Um, we've had across all these markets as well, uh, people competing with it. Um, on the various championships. Um, we, we are now in a place where we feel people really appreciate that it's a grinder built for taste. So people understand what's the strength of it. You know, people were so used to just focus on burr dimensions. So what's the burr size? And just say, oh, the bigger the burrs, the better the grinder. Like 10, 15 years ago, that used to be the only measure for many people to see if it's a valuable grinder or people had only vertical burst that's already enough 
you know, it has vertical burrs that helps, you know, to get all the residuals out because they naturally would just fall down. Uh, it helps, but it's not the only thing. Mm. But now people are like, okay, it's not about just the spec sheet and the technical specifications, it's as well about taste. I think that should be ultimately the right way to judge a grinder. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, another favorite thing of mine about the Bentwood is, uh, sorry, I'm being a fanboy here, but um, is just like how clean the dose is when it comes out of, of the spout, um, which of course makes it amenable to being a, a espresso grinder because then the coffee just drops right into the port of filter, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, do you want to talk about that piece of technology and how you got that to happen? Yeah, it was almost unplanned. Um, I was telling someone earlier today that initially we had the idea with a little motor to have a spout that would shake out the coffee. And we had that in place, it worked. And the first grinders went out and people were like, the spout arrives broken. Or like, it doesn't arrive broken, it's on purpose, a little motor shaking out the coffee. Uh, but people wouldn't get used to it. They were basically, everyone thought they broke the grinder or there was something wrong with it. And even if they would then understand that it's on purpose, see the benefit, they would say, oh, I got this new barista, he arrived and he said he's not working, he broke this, that new grinder. And we realized even if you as a manufacturer think you're doing the right thing, you got to understand what, what the customers want and they got to feel comfortable using it, right? Because if the customer is not comfortable using it, you can tell the best stories uh, they're not going to be happy. They're always going to be worried I'm breaking something, I'm doing something wrong. So it was tough, but we decided, okay, we got to look for a different way of getting the lowest retention possible. And then instead, read it the entire spout. And the way it works now, it's a very clean flow. So with the vertical burst, everything falls through in the grinding chamber. There are no edges the coffee can hide. And by the way, that is one of the big advantages which helped us as well in the US to get the NSF certification as only the second commercial grinder in place because um, there you got to make sure there are no, no 90 degree angles where the coffee can hide. So the coffee always stays fresh, doesn't get old and there are no worries about that. And so the coffee falls out, there's nothing in the grind chamber and then as it comes to the spout, to avoid static loading, it has a little anti-static plate which looks like this. So basically these, this is covered by the, by the grinding chamber. These little fingers, they keep vibrating and they release the coffee. Um, and that is killing the static. Um, and that is one of the key things. We have some customers that do take it out um, and they prefer just to let it flow. Um, which is a personal choice. Um, if you like it or not, you know, RDT technique is with, popular with some people. It's a personal choice. I think best is to leave it in. Um, it does a great job um, and it really helps to keep the flow really neat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, screwless burrs in the grinder, right? That's yeah, right. So yep. you're using the entire surface area, Yeah. basically. Um, and then I guess backtracking again, just to the the simple operation of if you if you were using this for espresso and you were single dosing, let's say you're on the competition stage, barista competition. Um, yeah, can you just talk us through like the the face of the grinder and like what you would do to, you know, produce your your ground coffee? Right. So you put in the beans. Um, from our experience, it doesn't matter really much if you start the motor first or not. I know in other grinders, people always start the motor first, put them in then. Doesn't matter, like it's powerful enough and it works perfectly if you pour in the beans first or not. Up to you. Um, what it does then, you have the feeder, so the auger, that is basically working like a pre-breaker. And that's why it works as well on the light roasts um, so good is because it pre-breaks already in a very regular mode. Um, as well, while on other grinders, it soaks up the beans very fast in the beginning, and then the first beans are ground in a different way than the last ones. Here, that feeder is making sure that there's a consistent rhythm uh, in the pre-breaking and then transporting the beans in, into the grinding chamber and breaking them. Um, and then it might just take a, a bit more of time until the anti-static plate releases the last bits. So if you really want to get to the zero retention, you just 
wait that little bit more and you'll see the rest coming out. But ultimately then it will keep no coffee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we've, we've seen some people have the habit still like hitting the, the, the spout um, as it ends just to be sure there's nothing inside. And that's again, it's like a personal thing. Some people just feel like that's part of the rhythm. So I feel like you were touching on a good point a minute ago is the, well, the talking about the auger, the pre-breaker, and um, it makes me think about the speed at which the beans are delivered to the burrs. Right. Um, so can you talk about, you know, how that's distinct with the bent wood, like the speed, and what's, you know, what benefits do you get from, from that speed? So it's certainly a bit slower than like the typical 100 millimeter burr grinder, let's say. Um, partially because the burrs are smaller, but then as well because on purpose the, the feeder, you know, gives it that rhythm. So we're not trying to just crash the beans as fast as possible. We want to make sure they're as consistent as possible. And we think it's worth that additional second um, to have that quality. Uh, I mean, you wait for all these months for the beans to grow, and you get the expensive beans over, I think it's worthwhile giving them one more second to be ground properly. Mm. Yeah, that, that seems fair. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I think it's a good time to open up to questions. Sure. If you think so. Um, I hope we have questions here because, yeah, we have, uh, you know, some wonderful roasters and some wonderful uh, past and present competitors here. Um, so we would just love to hear, you know, any questions you have, especially considering that, you know, the Bentwood Vertical 63 will be on these, you know, regional competition stages. And, um, and yeah, we would just love to have Manuel answer any questions that you may have. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. Um, what's not on this grinder that you wish were? You talk about the little motor and the exit chute right. and that, that you, know, you kind of had to adapt from feedback. Is there something on this grinder that you just wish you could have on there that maybe you had to engineer out or that, that you, you know, wish could be on the grinder that's not on there? Um, well, there's simply one thing where some people on the customer side, and as a result, I would like to have it as well, which it doesn't do, it's not made for grinding bags, right? Mm -hmm. And some people automatically think, okay, I'll get that bag, pour it in, and that's what it's made for. Um, it's not that it's gonna kill the grinder, but it's not what it's made for, right? And I think that's just important to know. I, I mean, I always say it does everything apart from grinding bags. That's my simple definition, right? And, but knowing that customers would like it, um, yeah, in my head, uh, that's something for the future. You touched on, actually Josh made the comment about uh, being a, a screwless burr. Can you elaborate on that? Right. And, and what, why is that different and better? So luckily someone put some burrs here. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, the idea was like 95% of the grinders have this have minimum three screws going through the face of the grinder and these screws are not made for breaking beans but they naturally do get in contact with the beans and are part of breaking the beans as well it's like in the middle of it which i believe is a crucial part of the process and as well it's it even if you have a bigger surface on other grinders, it's not a cutting surface, right? So you're taking away some of that valuable surface you get. And as well, that way you get way more consistency. Then in terms of changing the burrs, it doesn't make life any more difficult. It's just screws from here instead of here. And that geometry as well is specific to the grinder. Um, we chose as well, frankly, the 63 millimeter um, to get that for, um, because n we knew no one else does 63. And on other grinders we've seen in the past, the issue is often there are cheap copies in the market and people think they buy the originals and then they get a cheap copy of a 64 or 65 and then they are disappointing the result is not the same anymore and they say, why is my grinder not working the same way anymore when they change burrs? Well, with 63, that's 
kind of unique. Um, and then we came up with that geometry, which works for drip coffees and for espresso. And then we were like, that's a jackpot. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yes. Do you want to go? You go first. Uh, Manuel, you, you mentioned that the, the Bentwood is on a variety of stages, and we've seen it on Brewer's Cup as well as, you know, some espresso stages. Slowly walk through as you know, going through an espresso stage now with a limited amount of time, you've had people like Kyle and a lot of the people in this room who've competed before and that pressure up there. Being the Bentwood grinder, being a little slower, as you said a second ago, what are some tools moving forward that maybe you don't supply, but you will have access to, to be able to speed up this process because it's uh, taking a certain amount of coffee, pouring it in, and that time is constraint with the baristas making all these different shots and all the sig beverages to the caps to the espressos, you know, is that, will this grinder work for that? Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are two ways um, of getting to more speed. So if you work in a traditional espresso grinder mode, you probably would look at uh, filling up the hopper and then you get to the same speed as, as on all of the <coughs> other grinders you ever run. So you will have your, about four seconds for your double espresso shot. If you single dose, what we've seen a lot with competitors is as well, um, there's a third party supplier for bellows and they put the bellows on top so they don't wait that long to just grind like the three, three and a half seconds and then just use the bellow for a second and then everything is out. And the advantage is you really get everything out. So the retention is really to that minimum that you could get. And as a funny side note on the retention, it might be worth mentioning, one of the experiments um, that was done in Zurich was regarding measuring over, I think, a kilo of coffee um, if you could really get everything out or if there isn't something that disappears. And the surprise to many was, you know, the CO2 disappears. So automatically you have less weight in the end. So even if there are no coffee grounds in the grinder, some weight disappears just because of the CO2 disappearing during the grinding process. So that's just for those that really want to get to the 0, 0.0, that's just as a little side note, it would be magically if that keeps happening, then you might be adding something. <laughs> And it's been cool to see, you know, on some of your social media lately that RB Crafts, um, where is RB Crafts based again? In Germany. In Germany. Yeah. Um, has created a, a very cool uh, uh, portafilter filter stand. That's port right. So that's going to be on the market as of um, January. Yeah. Um, so for those that say, you know, I mainly focus on espresso, I want more traditionally portafilter filter stand. So there's been one that we've been supplying with, which is more flexible. You can as well, install it here on the base plate, could put it away, put it on a scale. Uh, so that's very flexible. If you want something more traditional, uh, like a portal filter support that just sits there in its position, um, we're gonna have that ready for January. It works for all kinds of portal filters, no matter what size and height. Um, it automatically feeds into uh, on that plate into the right position and it's a retrofit. So you can, with any existing grinder, use it as well. That's cool. Um, Luca, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, it was actually regarding the retention that you mentioned in the last answer. Um, you told us that you get the NSF approval, that is a, a really high standard, really demanding process. Uh, um, and you told us that there are no edges or points where the ground coffee can stand or get stuck. Um, how does it help uh, the, the barista in the competition uh, or uh, the coffee shop, uh, for example, to have no retention or really low retention uh, in, uh, in your grinder? Well, can you help uh, uh, a barista competitor, for example? Well, the important thing is, um, especially in the preparation of the competition, as you keep adjusting, you want to have exactly what you've adjusted it, right? So if you change from, let's say, 230 microns to 220, and you measure your next shot and in reality you still got some residuals of the last shot, you, know, you wouldn't fully see what you've actually dialed in. But what you want to have is exactly what you've dialed in. So if you get everything out, you know, okay, I changed 10 microns, it changes my extraction time by a second, 
that's what I got to do. And that's important because, you know, people in the preparation, they get, they get very nervous and they try last minute, maybe a new coffee or, or this one and that. And they don't want another variable. You want that consistency. You want at least one variable eliminated and know, okay, here I know what I'm doing. And then in a coffee shop, it's as well, if you want to use it, not just, so people filling up the hopper and working all day in out the same coffee, they care much less about retention, right? Because anyways, in a minute is another shot of the same coffee. But people that change coffee quite a bit, or at least every now and then, they want to make sure there's nothing of that other coffee inside. So if they use it mainly for the guest coffee of the week and then they have a customer coming up, but I want that filter coffee, and they say, okay, next shot I'm single dosing filter. They don't want that guest coffee of the week, they want that filter coffee. Was that like, so when you're designing the machine, right, you're, you're going through all your engineering things, right? Was that one of the things that you set out as the, as the kind of the core of that onion you spoke about was like no retention? Was that, was that the, one of your targets or did it just kind of happen? Or why is that so important? I understand for the coffee stuff, but like from an engineering side, that's not usually the method that people go about building a piece of equipment. Right. That's kind of like the last thing they do usually. Because uh, like at Worlds when I competed, <clears throat> I dosed everything a half gram heavy. Everything. A half gram heavy because I, I assumed a half gram loss on right. every shot. But when we, when I use the bellows on your grinder, uh, depends on who cleaned it out before. It may be <laughs> actually overweight, which is crazy. It's like 25 grams in, 25.3 comes out, which is right. whoever did clean it well the last time, probably me. Uh, <laughs> so was it like a, was it in, was that like a focus for you or did it just kind of just become one of the, your key achievements? It, it was a focus because before I started to ask around, I asked specialty roasters, Q graders, baristas, I asked you around what would be the key things you want from a grinder? And what, what are the key things you believe that impact taste? And one of them was retention and it has always been addressed and mentioned as one of the key characteristics of most grinders but without actually changing the mechanics, which didn't make sense to me, right? It just was added as a claim to something existing. And I just don't think it's right. Even today, I wouldn't call it zero retention. I would call it, you know, minimum retention because there will always be a little something. And I think it would be wrong to say it's zero, right? And as I said before, you know, there's even <laughs> the question if you can get out 100% of what you've put in in terms of weight and we always measure by weight right we don't open the grinder up every time afterwards and check what's inside that said um, I know and I, I don't want to intervene here in the hygiene routines of any coffee shops but I know coffee shops that used to open up the grinder at least once a day to clean and always had like two grams inside, you know, between the, the screws on the burrs, between the little angles. So they, they might still, you know, after cleaning a grinder, these gaps fill up and you still get out the same pretty much what you've put in. But in the end, that coffee gets old, right? And even those guys, I saw them opening it up maximum once a week or even less because every time they open up, they saw if there's something, it's in the spout. So they changed the routine from opening the grinder from the front and looking at the birds and cleaning all that to just taking out the spout by hand, taking out the anesthetic plate, cleaning that because that's where you might find something. Despite that would come out with the next shot. For the end of the day, clean that, just the spout, no tools needed and clean that instead. Uh, because they would see inside there's hardly anything. And we've done testing like going kilos, kilos of coffee, opening up and there's, it's been really so minimum uh, and as, especially the important thing is that the coffee, the minimum that is there, that sits on the burrs, right, from the last shot, a bit of powder here and there, and not, and with the next shot that will go out. It, it's more problematic if it sits in some angles where it won't go out for a month if you don't clean it. We'll only get more. I think most of the questions have been about retention, but um, we talked about espresso and small doses. Does retention change when we do larger doses, like say for a batch brew coffee or if we're doing like maybe a pound of cold brew, do we see more retention with those larger doses? 
So counterintuitively, it's the opposite. Uh, what happens is the more weight you got, got from above, the better the flow, because the weight from above push, keeps pushing the coffee, and it will, at a higher speed in the end, be pushed out. Now, when you only do like 18 grams shot, um, the last beans, despite we try with the feeder to, you know, get it in that same rhythm, you will still have at the end a bit less flow as it comes out and you have a higher risk of getting that bit of retention left. So the more, the less. Uh, you talked about uh, the grinder using microns. Uh, so what exactly is the scale like? zero to 800 and in doing so does the wheel go like one full rotation and once it hits it does it stop or does it keep going like how does that work it keeps going so you can go from i say don't go under 80 because typically um, at some point you get close to burst touching um, and under 80 as well you won't be able to extract even like turkish or greek coffee depending where you go they will call, call it differently um, but under 100 micron already, I don't know anyone extracting there. And I think we have even an extreme customer in New York that has been doing Turkish light roast, yes. and even he succeeded. Um, so that's the most extreme case I know, Turkish light roast, which is rare. Um, as you go coarser, um, you can go until it's unusable. And we had that. We had customers going for, like, instead of like a filter at 600, they went for 1,600 and saying, I get half beans out. Well, it doesn't make much sense anymore. But what does make sense, um, there are some cold brew recipes, for example, uh, where they go very coarse and they still enjoy it. And it's, for the grinder, like for the motor, it's much easier to go that coarse. But to get consistent grounds out is even more difficult because, you know, on espresso, the the coffee spends more time between the burrs, so there's more time to shape it. While on a cold brew setting, it's so short and it already comes out, to get the particles somewhat consistent at that time is very difficult. And we get very good results on cold brew here as well. And that's where people sometimes go quite extreme coarse, uh, because they're like, ah, I have this freaky coffee and I want to get that extract it that way and they're happy with it. But yeah, thanks for asking that, John, because he brings up a good point that we have the zero to 1,000 scale, yeah. um, sort of the demarcations are zero to 1,000. And then uh, you can continue to keep spinning it past that if you want to, but, but that's kind of the, yeah, the scale. And if ever it would happen that you see half beans coming out, then you know, just Go a thousand finer, and then you're probably in a good place. <laughs> and sort of going along with that, I will say, and I think people agree who have interacted with the grinder, and if you haven't, you should do so afterwards. Um, this this wheel is one of the fun and great things about the grinder. So um, yes, and it, the funny thing is, when we came up with it, and I went to a company to see and see it out of aluminium. Like they looked at me, they were like, why don't you do it out of plastic? It would be so cheap. <laughs> and whoever had this in the hands and has felt that smooth movement, I know people that don't grind coffee and still use the grinder just for doing this. <laughs> they just enjoy it. It, it, it. It's really weird. Like obviously I've won at home as well whenever we have guests coming over and some think they can put in a an espresso capsule on top and get coffee. And, and I'm like, no, no, it's only a coffee grinder. And, and then they still sit, they're like, but what's that? Uh -huh. And they keep going back and forth. Um, yeah, there's something about that feeling, which is good. And as well, people are worried, you know, is it going to move by itself, but it doesn't. It has exactly that feeling. You know, it stays where it is, but if you want to move it, it moves. And to your point on the micron setting as well, you can always read from here if it's properly zero calibrated, so you don't need to open it up. You know, you just keep turning when the grinding chamber is empty and you can try afterwards yourself. It just, where you get that resistance is where we set it initially to zero. And if you would open up the grinder because you still think you want to clean it, 
um, you always get back to that same point. So you don't need to recalibrate as you open and close again. And that's been great for people as well that said, I actually don't know how do I zero calibrate. And if ever you were to do it for whatever reason, you can do it from outside. So you don't even need to open up the grinder. You take an Allen key and from outside you just adjust it. Because there, there are some people that want to calibrate in a different way than we do. And they say, that's for me a zero point and they just change it. Mm -hmm. So your goal is that they're all the same. Exactly, yeah. So like these grinders here and the grinder that's back in Zurich, in theory, should have the same exactly. calibration. Yeah, and that, that's so great. So in that way, people can as well give their customers, if they buy bags for at home, they, and they have, would have the same grinder. We have quite some people buying it for home. Um, they can give them the recipe. They say, that coffee, you know, you grind it at... 600, 200, whatever. I know we talked about it having like very little retention. So in your opinion, like how often should we actually like open it up and clean it out? I think it depends a lot what you do. So if you do filter coffee, um, you're going to be fine you know, as well if, if you don't open it up for weeks. Uh, I recently opened up uh, one grinder that has been used for two and a half years for filter. It was nothing, really. I can say it was not worthwhile opening. I was really surprised myself because two and a half years is quite some time. But he's doing only filter. Espresso, you will always have more finds that somewhere could, that could go somewhere. So there would still, you know, depend. And then it depends as well how oily that is. So if you have rather medium to light roast, um, it's not going to be as sticky. Uh, while if you have like dark roast, especially the commercial grade, really oily ones, um, they're going to be more sticky. They would open probably once a week. And then how fine you go as well. So if someone grinds really Turkish coffee, so very fine as well, I would clean more often. You're someone who has built and designed a grinder basically from the ground up. But you're still built on some foundational mechanical and engineering things. It's burrs. It's we're getting burrs to do better things. We're getting retention to do less, so on and so forth. <clears throat> As someone who dreams about grinders yourself, is this the best iteration of a grinder that we can think about? Is there something... Like I know Titus just put out like the, a, a beta of the cafe size rollers, right, mm -hmm. for burrs. Do we expect that? What's to you, maybe there's some grid of cold lasers that it never does, doesn't use burrs, right? <laughs> What's the, because it, let, let's be honest, this is a version of Stone Age technology right. that we're getting better and better and better and better at. It's like Henry Ford once said, if I were to ask my customers what they wanted, they would have said faster horses, better whips, and more comfortable carriages, right? <laughs> And so he thought, well, what's the next possible thing? So right. when you dream, what's the next thing, the 23rd century thing that we can bring into the 21st century for grinders? Well, I think it, so there are a couple of aspects. One is um, the quality of coffee and so how you grind and how, what result you're going to get in terms of particles and how they're going to extract in the cup. So that's one. Then there's an aspect of how enjoyable it is to operate the grinder. And then it's a matter of cost, right? And the points you are raising, like little roller mills, I had it in my mind as well. Reality is if you would do that, even if you were to make it possible in terms of size, you want to as well have something that is somewhat usable in terms of size. It's another limitation. Um, you're going to produce it as, at a somewhat reasonable cost. Um, so same would be if it was laser cut. So there are a couple of things you could think of, but as technology stands today, it might cost 10 or 20 or $30,000 each. And then I wouldn't consider it worthwhile for the time being going in more detail. So most of the things that I explored, at least to some extent, 
Uh, for example, I did one as well with the cooling technology, right? We were thinking about doing that. So said in a very simple way of putting in a little fridge. So the coffee is extremely cool inside. Uh, it's just a matter of cost and as well as certification. So to get that certified and cost-wise and in a safe way is problematic. Same thing you would probably have with laser um, and on roller mills, it's the cost and the space. So I think, at least that's what, what I believe today, we've put in everything that is at a somewhat achievable price and uh, somewhat in terms of size manageable, um, aesthetically as well, somewhat appealing. You can do something, you know, like an industrial grind as well, but you know, who's gonna use it? Um, so I hope that's what we've achieved until someone proves us wrong. <laughs> Yeah, and I do think, you know, from my perspective, you know, selling coffee grinders and, and working with a lot of coffee grinders, I mean, there are these little aspects of, of a coffee grinder that you always would love to improve by 3%, you know, and you could just continue to, to get better and better at that, um, you know, and, and like I said, one thing I love about the Bentwood is, <clears throat> you know, when everything is sort of in its proper place, you know, the the static guard, the spout and everything, you just get this beautiful stream that I've never seen. I've never seen that little static from, you know, barely any other grinder. So, so I feel like that aspect was kind of, you know, uh, yeah, optimized in a great way, sort of, you know, but yeah, <laughs> sorry again, <laughs> me being a fanboy. Um, would love to hear more questions or I know like we do have Bentwood owners out here or folks who have used Bentwood uh, on the competition stage or the prelim stage. So we'd love to hear your experience with the Bentwood if you have something to share or, um, but also more questions is great. Okay, so um, I know from working as a barista and brewing coffee, we always talk about temperature and how much brewing temperature is important. And so in higher volume situations, when a grinder is running continuously or running a lot versus in the afternoon when it slows down and it's not running as hot. Ultimately, when you're milling something down to a particle size, there's gonna be resistance and friction happening. So when there is higher volume grinding operation, is that temperature inside the chamber creating an inconsistency of that particle size that you've discovered? Um, so first of all, the good thing is with all these big aluminum parts, they can absorb a lot of heat. So it stays at like room temperature for a very long time, or it will stay at room temperature as long as you don't get over that tipping point where it might be too much. And too much being on the one end side, if people still decide to use it to grind bags, right? Um, as I said, that, which is not the main intention. And then you get at some point, you know, at that level. Um, or if you get at a very, very high level frequency um, of grinding espresso, especially light roast espresso, non-stop of a long period of time. Now, uh, we've seen it takes a long time. It's rather problematic and that's surprising to many people. And that's what we've seen. I think it was at a roasting competition. Surprisingly, the, the worst for the grinder is if it runs without having any beans. People think, oh, I can leave it on anyways, you know, no beans going through, it's no work for the grinder. Reality being, you know, as it keeps spinning, 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 spinning at 1,400 RPM, and there's nothing it can transport, not even that bit of heat, it will get the fastest hot when there's no, no resistance and nothing to go against. Uh, and that's where you have issues. So you have some busy coffee shops that are like, okay, I'll do a single dose, I'll leave it on, you know, they prepare the coffee, they walk away, come back a minute later, do another one, and they feel like I've used it only like once a minute. In reality, it has been constantly on, right? And that is that then you will start having issues. So I always recommend, you know, finish your dose whenever it's done, but, but finish it and stop the grinder, and then when you, put in beans again, then start it. And that's important. 
So uh, the good news is, so we had, for example, because the grinder is quiet, we had at a trade show, for example, a guy that didn't notice the grinder has been on for half an hour. And he left it on. He didn't hear it because, you know, trade show, it's busy and noisy. And he didn't hear it. It was next to it. At some point, it just stopped. So it has a thermal protector. So the second it would get too hot, it, the motor just protects itself and stops. Just let it cool down. It's going to work normally again, which is better than ruining the motor. Um, but yeah, those were the cases where we had trouble. And then in terms of volume, we have some busy coffee shops that have taken it to the extreme. Uh, we were talking about this yesterday. Um, typically, I would say that grinder, I would use it for like, let's say two, three kilos, whatever that's in pounds um, a day. That's my standard recommendation. We have coffee shops that use it for six kilos a day. Then it depends a bit how that, those six kilos are spread out. Do you do these six kilos just in two hours or do you do the six kilos in eight hours? So that makes a big difference. I can't tell you the perfect kilo uh, or pounds because it really depends as well on your working rhythm. Um, how intuitive is the programming of this? I mean, I, I can see some of the buttons are very, I know what a single and a double is, but beyond that, can you walk? Walk us through. So the idea is to not give too many options to make your life easy. Uh, see, there's not much you can do wrong. Um, basically, either you decide for time dosing or you just go on off. If you time dose, you can program these three buttons with the idea of having single shot, double shot, and this uh, as a perch shot, um, or adding that little bit extra and this like a barista on off button. To program the time, you just have that menu, it guides you with the lights, what you can do. So now then I go on short, I confirm, and I just go up and down on the time, I confirm and I go out and that's it. And then here it counts the shots. So there's nothing else to do. I thought when we came up with it, people are gonna complain, we want more. It's the only thing, no one has ever mentioned anything <laughs> that they want more, surprisingly. Like, not even the most demanding customer has asked for more. That's been really a surprise. I thought someone's going to come with, but I would like to see your change. Hasn't happened. Nice. Spider, we had someone recently, the first time ever, someone saying, why does the grinder say hello to me? <laughs> it feels like it's a person. Uh, okay. Uh, you can even delete that if you want. But. We had more positive feedback on that, actually. So people develop a relationship with the grinder, which <laughs> I think has been good over the last two years. <laughs> Another question? There are some grinders that use um, sensors to measure microns, like some of Melkonig's E80s use sensors. And as far as I know, there aren't any sensors on this grinder. No. Why did you go with that? Is there any like positives to that? And well. Basically, sensors add complexity and cost. That's a bit uh, <laughs> the downside of it, right? And I wanted as well to make sure that there are as little components that would need potentially service. So here, it's mechanically, right, how you set them. So there's nothing that can break. On the sensors that we tried, we had a couple of them actually for various things to try. It seemed there's always like a complexity, you know, a sensor can mistake or misread things often, you know. You have somewhere a coffee bean and it misreads it as something. Um, or it can just end of lifetime or whatever. And you still want your grinder to work. Uh, while here, we haven't had any grinders breaking down because of a component not working anymore, end of lifetime. Manuel, what was the time it took from start to your first production? Because, you know, if you, if you, you know, both of us been in the grinding market for a long, long time and we know how long it takes, but what, what did you see was the most difficult process and how did you get to where you got so fast? The key thing was doing these feedback loops during the development. 
So giving it in the hand of people that had the main intention not to give positive feedback, but mainly I know everything, I'm gonna <laughs> find 10 things that are not good about this grinder. And it's more painful, but as well, it's more helpful because, so in the beginning it has been very frustrating. So I thought I have something great and then they tell you, no, but this, 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 this doesn't work. And you go back and back and back and change, change, change. Uh, it's been, in the end, I've been pushing every day to get faster. And we did it in around two years, which, has, which is fast. Um, but it's been day and night, blood, sweat and tears. And you also mentioned certification. You know, like you said, there's only two grinders, and this has been one of them in the complete market that truly has the truly NSF, you know, because the rest of them, NSF, they say they're in, it conforms to NSF. That's, that's a different game, conforms to an NSF. What made you feel like you wanted to get to that point, or was it just the part selections when you were doing it, you were thinking of that, or what made you think that I'm going to get the NSF on this grinder? Well, I just think it gives the customer the, the feeling or the knowledge. It's more than a feeling, you know. Someone is certified for you that this is conform with food safety regulation. I think that's great, you know. That entity that in the US is testing if it's really conform, tests everything, including where all the materials come from, how it's the entire architecture is done of the grinder. Um, if that is good to be in contact with food, well, if it's, you just conform, you say, okay, you know, I've read the regulations and, you know, I think it's in line. Uh, it's not the same thing. There are so many details you gotta look at. And then you really know, I can tell my customer, whatever happens, don't worry. It's, you have the safety that it's food safe. And this goes beyond, so people think it's just where, where the beans are touching, but on the coffee grinder, the regulation says, even like the hopper lid needs to be conformed because theoretically, someone fills it up until the, bot the top and, and the bean is touching that plastic, for example. Or even that outside, that rubber ring needs to be, for the US, done in a way that is certified. Despite the chance of that touching beans is very little but it's all these little details. And as well, it needs to be easy to clean. So by that, you as well know that someone externally says it's easy to clean. Every area needs to be so easy to access to clean. And there, there's no place uh, where coffee can go and stay. For example, if you take away the drip tray, uh, where, where that base plate gets to this, we, we have a ceiling here so no coffee can go inside. On others, you would have like that little uh, gap and coffee would go inside. You wouldn't care. Once you lift up the grinder, you see underneath some coffee. In that case, everything is sealed. Any other burning questions out here? Or not burning. Um, or not burning. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it would be, yes. I mean, I'll get a question. I know you mentioned it's fine to start the grinder under a load. It makes, or yeah, you said that's fine. In terms, have you ran a particle analysis with starting the grinder under a load versus not? Is there, is there a difference? Well, well, the more load you get, you will have slightly more, uh, or a finer grind setting automatically. So the more weight you got, automatically it's going to compress a bit the coffee a bit more and it's going to be a bit fine as a result. So it will change slightly your grind setting. That's why if you work with a full hopper, but that's true for any grinder, I would say, uh, as you get really low, I would start refilling and not wait until it's completely empty because otherwise the, the, the last shots you would need a slightly different setting to get to the same. But that's something like a takeaway for any grinder. You will, the last shots will never be the same as the first ones. How did you come up with uh, the name Ben Food? 
What's the origin behind the, the brand? Uh, the origin is I was looking for a name that I could register internationally, which already is a challenge. Uh, I was not lucky enough to have any cool first or surname that I could use for a brand name. Um, and then I'm originally Austrian from Vienna and I wanted to call it after the first Viennese coffee shop. You know, the city has got a long coffee shop tradition. And then I looked up uh, the first Viennese coffee shop and it was called Blaue Flasche, which means in English blue bottle. <laughs> <laughs> and then I already had that feeling. Uh, I, I went on the Blue Bottle homepage, uh, about section, and then it said, uh, I think the grandfather of the Blue Bottle founder was from Vienna. So he had done exactly the same research to get to the name Blue Bottle. So, and then I started reading about the Blue Bottle in Vienna, the first coffee shop, and then I read about all the development of these coffee shops. And it kept coming back that everything, you know, the traditional coffee house chairs, not only in Vienna, but as well, like in France or Italy, they were all made out of bentwood, you know, which is um, the typical rounded coffee chairs. Uh, you have as well um, the newspaper holders and everything is out of bentwood, which is a very nice ecological way of bending wood, right, under steam. So you're not cutting out and have a lot of waste, but you're just uh, steaming and then bending the wood to get it into the shape you want. I was like, that's actually a nice thing and it's a nice, um, yeah, nice little history. And then I checked and I figured out no one has registered that name anyway. And I was like, that's it. Then I started asking people, do you, do you know Bentwood? And people, yeah, of course I know. It's a luxury brand. I'm like, interesting. It turned out, I, it must be something about the name that people have the feeling they've heard it already. I don't know if it's because it sounds like other brands that exist, I don't know. But at least it has the right reaction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it recalls like the made by hand, uh, you know, that people may appreciate uh, even like people that buy high-end products uh, want something. Uh, Especially from Europe, they want something really made by hand, so Ben would may record that, that part. Yeah. Well, I think this has been awesome. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Manuel. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Really appreciate you coming. Um, and, you know, we do have a coffee station set up in the back, and we have some Bentwoods up front, and Manuel will be here um, for a while. We're going to trap him and keep him, keep him here for a while. I'll stay here <laughs> until Sunday. <laughs> so, um, yeah, feel free to grab a beverage and hang out. And thank you once again. Thank you. Thanks for coming.